Let us kneel, let us pray the preparatory prayer together. <clears throat> My Lord Jesus Christ, you have made this journey to die for me with unspeakable love, and I have so many times ungratefully abandoned you. But now I love you with all my heart, and because I love you, I am sincerely sorry for ever having offended you. Pardon me, my God, and permit me to accompany you on this journey. You go to die for love of me. I want my beloved Redeemer to die for love of you. My Jesus, I will live and die always united to you. At the cross her station keeping Stood the mournful mother weeping Close to Jesus to the last The first station Jesus is condemned to death. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Consider how Jesus Christ, after being scourged and crowned with thorns, was unjustly condemned by Pilate to die on the cross. My adorable Jesus, it was not Pilate. No, it was my sins that condemned you to die. I beseech you by the merits of this sorrowful journey to assist my soul on its journey to eternity. I love you, my beloved Jesus. I love you more than I love myself. With all my heart, I repent of ever having offended you. Never let me be separated from you again. Grant that I may love you always, and then do with me as you will. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <laughs> Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. And glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Through her heart his sorrow sharing, all his bitter anguish bearing. Now at length the sword has passed. The second station, Jesus takes up his cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Consider Jesus as he walked this road with the cross on his shoulders, thinking of us and offering to his Father in our behalf the death he was about to suffer. My most beloved Jesus, I embrace all the sufferings you have destined for me until death. I beg you by all you suffered in carrying your cross to help me carry mine with your perfect peace and resignation. I love you, Jesus, my love. I repent of ever having offended you. Never let me separate myself from you again. Grant that I may love you always, <clears throat> and then do with me as you will. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. <clears throat> Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Oh, how sad and sore distressed was that mother highly blessed of the soul begotten one. The third station, Jesus falls the first time. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Consider the first fall of Jesus. 
loss of blood from the scourging and crowning with thorns, had so weakened him that he could hardly walk, and yet he had to carry that great load upon his shoulders. As the soldiers struck him cruelly, he fell several times under the heavy cross. My beloved Jesus, it was not the weight of the cross, <clears throat> but the weight of my sins which made you suffer so much. By the merits of this first fall, save me from falling into mortal sin. I love you, O Jesus, with all my heart. I am sorry that I have offended you. May I never offend you again. Grant that I may love you always, and then do with me as you will. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Christ above in torment hang, she beneath beholds the pain of her <clears throat> dying glorious Son. The fourth station, Jesus meets with his afflicted mother. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Consider how the son met his mother on his way to Calvary. Jesus and Mary gazed at each other, with, and their looks became as so many arrows to wound those hearts which loved each other so tenderly. My most loving Jesus, by the pain you suffered in this meeting, Grant me the grace of being truly devoted to your most holy mother, and you, my queen, who was overwhelmed with sorrow. Obtain for me by your prayers a tender and loving remembrance of the passion of your divine Son. I love you, Jesus, my love, above all things. <clears throat> I repent of ever having offended you. Never allow me to offend you again. Grant that I may love you always, and then do with me as you will. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Is there one who would not weep? Whelmed in misery so deep, Christ, dear Mother, to behold. The fifth station, Simon of Cyrene, is forced to carry the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. <laughs> Consider how weak and weary Jesus was. At each step he was at the point of expiring. Fearing that he would die on the way when they wished him to die the infamous death of the cross, they forced Simon of Cyrene to help carry the cross after our Lord. My beloved Jesus, I will not refuse the cross as Simon did. I accept and embrace it. I accept in particular the death that is destined for me with all the pains that may accompany it. I unite it to your death and I offer it to you. You have died for love of me. I will die for love of you and to please you. Help me by your grace. I love you, Jesus, my love. I repent of ever having offended you. Never let me offend you again. 
Grant that I may love you always, and then do with me as you will. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Can the human heart refrain from partaking in her pain? In that mother pain untold, the sixth station, Veronica, wipes the face of Jesus. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Consider the compassion of the holy woman, Veronica, seeing Jesus in such distress, his face bathed in sweat and blood. She presented him with her veil. Jesus wiped his face and left upon the cloth the image of his sacred countenance. My beloved Jesus, your face was beautiful before you began this journey, but now it no longer appears beautiful and is disfigured with wounds and blood. Alas, my soul also was once beautiful when it received your grace in baptism, but I have since then disfigured it with my sin. You alone, my Redeemer, can restore it to its former beauty. Do this by the merits of your passion, and then do with me as you will. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <clears throat> Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Bruised, derided, cursed, defiled, she beheld her tender child, all with bloody scourges rent. The seventh station, Jesus falls the second time. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. <laughs> Consider how the second fall of Jesus under his cross renews the pain in all the wounds of the head and members of our afflicted Lord. My most gentle Jesus, how many times you have forgiven me and how many times I have fallen again and begun to again to offend you. By the merits of this second fall, give me the grace to persevere in your love until death. Grant that in all my temptations, I may always have recourse to you. I love you, Jesus, my love, with all my heart. I am sorry that I have offended you. Never let me offend you again. Grant that I may love you always, and then do with me as you will. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
for the sins of his own nation saw him hang in desolation till his spirit forth he sent the eighth station jesus speaks to the holy women of jerusalem we adore you o christ and we praise you Consider how the women wept with compassion, seeing Jesus so distressed and dripping with blood as he walked along. Jesus said to them, Weep not so much for me, but rather for your children. By Jesus, laden with sorrow, I weep for the sins which I have committed against you because of the punishment I deserve for them, and still more because of the displeasure they have caused you who have loved me with an infinite love. It is your love more than the fear of hell, which makes me weep for my sins. My Jesus, I love you more than myself. I am sorry that I have offended you. Never allow me to offend you again. Grant that I may love you always, and do with me as you will. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <laughs> Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. O sweet Mother, fount of love, touch my spirit from above. Make my heart with yours accord. The ninth station, Jesus falls the third time. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Consider how Jesus Christ fell for the third time. He was extremely weak, and the cruelty of his executioners was excessive. They tried to hasten his steps, though he hardly had strength to move. My outrage, Jesus, by the weakness you suffered in going to Calvary, give me enough strength to overcome all human respect and all my evil passions, which have led me to despise your friendship. I love you, Jesus, my love, with all my heart. I am sorry for ever having offended you. Never permit me to offend you again. Grant that I may love you always, and then do with me as you will. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <clears throat> Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Make me feel as you have felt. Make my soul to glow and melt With the love of Christ my Lord The tenth station, Jesus is stripped of his garments We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you Consider how Jesus was violently stripped of his clothes by his executioners The inner garments adhere to his lacerated flesh and the soldiers tore them off so roughly that the skin came with them. Have pity for your Savior so cruelly treated and tell him, My innocent Jesus, by the torment you suffer in being stripped of your garments, help me to strip myself of all attachment for the things of earth, 
that I may place all my love in you, who are so worthy of my love. I love you, O Jesus, with all my heart. I am sorry for ever having offended you. Never let me offend you again. Grant that I may love you. And hallowed be thy. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Holy Mother, pierce me through who in my heart each wound renew who of my Savior crucified. The eleventh station, Jesus is nailed to the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Consider Jesus thrown down upon the cross. He stretched out his arms and offered to his eternal Father the sacrifice of his life for our salvation. They nailed his hands and feet, and then raising the cross, left him to die in anguish. My despised Jesus, nail my heart to the cross, that it may always remain there to love you and never leave you again. I love you more than myself. I am sorry for ever having offended you. Never permit me to offend you again. Grant that I may love you always, and then do with me as you will. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Let me share with you his pain, who for all our sins was slain, who for me in torments died. The twelfth station, Jesus dies upon the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Consider how your Jesus, after three hours of agony on the cross, is finally overwhelmed with suffering and abandoning himself to the weight of his body, bows his head and dies. My dying Jesus, I devoutly kiss the cross on which you would die for love of me. I deserve, because of my sins, to die a terrible death, but your death is my hope. By the merits of your death, give me the grace to die, embracing your feet and burning with love of you. I yield my soul into your hands. I love you with my whole heart. I am sorry that I have offended you. Never let me offend you again. Grant that I may love you always, and then do with me as you will. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Let me mingle tears with thee, mourning him who mourned for me all the days that I may live. The thirteenth station, Jesus is taken down from the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Consider how, after our Lord had died, he was taken down from the cross by two of his disciples, Joseph and Nicodemus, and placed in the arms of his afflicted mother. She received him with unutterable tenderness and pressed him close to her bosom. O mother of sorrows, for the love of your son, accept me as your servant and pray to him for me. And you, my Redeemer, since you have died for me, allow me to love you, for I desire only you and nothing more. I love you, Jesus, my love, and I am sorry that I have offended you. Never let me offend you again. Grant that I may love you always, and then do with me as you will. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <laughs> Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. By the cross with you to stay, there with you to weep and pray, is all I ask of you to give. The fourteenth station, Jesus is placed in the Holy Sepulchre. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Consider how the disciples carried the body of Jesus to its burial while his holy mother went with them and arranged it in the sepulchre with her own hands. They then closed the tomb and all departed. O oh, my buried Jesus, I kiss the stone that closes you in but you gloriously did rise again on the third day. I beg you by your resurrection that I may be raised gloriously on the last day to be united with you in heaven, to praise you and love you forever. I love you, Jesus, and I repent of ever having offended you. Grant that I may love you always and then do with me as you will. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Virgin of all virgins, bless. Listen to my fond request. Let me share your grief divine. Let us kneel, let us pray together the prayer to Jesus Christ crucified. My good and dear Jesus, I kneel before you most earnestly to engrave upon my heart a deep and lively faith, hope, and charity with true repentance for my sins and a firm resolve to make amends. As I reflect upon your five wounds, and dwell upon them with deep compassion and grief, I recall, good Jesus, the words of the prophet David spoke long ago concerning yourself. They have pierced my hands and my feet. 
I numbered all my bones. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O good Jesus, hear me. Within your wounds, hide me. Separated from you, never let me be. From the evil one, protect me. At the hour of my death, call me. And close to you, bid me, that with your saints I may be, praising you forever and ever. Amen. would remind you we have 8 o'clock Mass tomorrow morning. It's the Feast of St. Joseph, and your senses do not fail you that we do have the St. Joseph bread over there, which we'll bless and distribute. Don't leave, come back. My name is Paul Metzger, I'm a volunteer for St. Joseph's Evangelization Network. Thank you for coming out in person tonight, not virtually like everything has been in the last two years. Um, I normally go to a men's fellowship on Friday night, but I took off filming last night, so I had to come tonight. <laughs> but I don't regret it one bit because your speaker, Michael Patrick Burke, is a very mysterious man, and he wrote a very mysterious book. I mean, who writes a book, Waiting to Die, Running to Live? That's mysterious. I couldn't wait to hear his story. So without... Any further ado, I'd like to welcome Michael Patrick Burke. I think I need a nickname, Mysterioso. Sounds like a Superman of some sort. Uh, want to define something for you? And the, we're going to define hope. It's got a real specific definition that really resonates with me. It's expecting the best in the future and working to achieve it. Believing that a good future is something that you can bring about. Now, there's a lot of self-determination in that, that we can bring about a good future. Uh, and we want to have that kind of hope, but that kind of hope is hard sometimes when there's so much going on. And as Catholics, we get a nice boost from our God. I was looking for some things that resonated in the Bible with this idea of hope. And in Romans 15, we're told, May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we have a duty in this, right? We are to uh, foster hope within ourselves in kind of this partnership with God to have more and more hope. And we need to own our response to what's going out in the world and be inspired by God himself, the God of hope. Now, to me, that seems like a really empowering combination to know that I have what it takes and I get the boost and the support from our Lord. Uh, in Mark 9, we're told, 
Everything is possible for he who believes. So what I keep hearing over and over is have hope. I can help you with the hope. And with that, you can do anything with me. So Lent to me is the ultimate season of hope where we anticipate with great joy the promise of Christ's suffering on the cross. The ultimate reward, if you will, of heaven. I'm going to repeat the definition again. Hope is to expect the best and work to achieve it. The daily effort to live as a child of God is a long, long journey, and we're going to be tested. And when that test happens, we need to recommit and recommit and recommit, especially in the times of uncertainty and challenge. That's when hope is most needed, right? When things are easy, hope's easy. So, in Romans again, we're told, for in this hope we're saved, but hope that is seen, seen, is no hope at all. We, uh, he who hopes for what they already have. If you already have something, you don't need hope, right? If it's tangible, you don't need hope. Uh, so when I was born, uh, I was really healthy for about six months, and then I developed a, just a relentless cough. And I started losing weight as a six-month-old, and that doesn't make any sense, right? And they couldn't figure out what was going on, couldn't figure out what's going on, and then finally on my first birthday-ish, uh, I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis which at the time was the number one genetic killer of children. There was not even a single teen alive with the disease. Certainly not an adult. As you could imagine, against unbelievable odds, somehow my parents had hope. They had to start just an overwhelming medical routine. I've been taking somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 thousand pills a year simply to digest food. Without it, I would die of malnutrition. At the same time, I've had to do hundreds and hundreds of hours every year of therapy on my lungs so I wouldn't die of infections, lung infections. The routine it just was overwhelming, but they did it. Every night, my father's duty was to lay me across his lap I mean, remember, I'm little, little, all the way from little, little to 12 years old. He would just start thumping on me. Pop, 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 pop. Beating on me. He did that 800 times a night for 12 years. And that was therapy to clear this extra junk in my lungs. It would make me cough and get it out. Only hope would have them do that. And when dad was traveling on business, mom would do it too. So they both got their frustrations out on me. We did that camping. We camped a lot. And around the campfire, my dad would be thumping on me. Right? No matter what and when, they were dedicated to me, while others weren't so dedicated. They had a very strong hope and a very strong faith. When it was my turn, to have hope, it was a little more difficult for me. I was 15, and I started realizing really what was going on. And what it was is I was in high school, and I had new friends, and they were asking, what are those pills? And why do you cough? And why do you go into the hospital every year? And I had to tell them, and I really didn't, really didn't know. Yeah, I've got this thing called cystic fibrosis, but I, I didn't really know. No one had ever asked me. They're my little guys, you know, the kids I went to grade school with, they never thought of it differently. But the new kids, they did. Plus, I was in the hospital every summer for a week, and they were curious about that. So I, I was like, wow, maybe I should learn about this thing. So before the internet, I rode my bicycle up to the library, and I pulled out some medical journal, read all about it. Yeah, OK, I know all that. But I saw the life expectancy. For the first time in my life, I saw it. And it was 18, and I was 15. And then I learned that the original life expectancy was five. 
and it didn't settle very well in my young 15-year-old mind. And I lost a good deal of hope in the future. Now, what's funny about this is I was a pretty normal kid. My lung functions were 100%. I was little and a little skinny, but I was in normal range. I was playing football with my brothers and in uh, soccer and baseball. But I, did, I had no, I, uh, I really just couldn't see far into the future. So it's funny how we break free of these things. So going back to my childhood, when they got that diagnosis, they were told germs are going to get them. So they really started sheltering me and protecting me. And while my older brothers were playing in creeks and in the woods and playing in the rain, I was being sheltered. And then one day, all the neighborhood boys, including my brothers, are out in the backyard playing football, or what was some sort of football, basically kill the kid who has the ball, and when he fumbles it, kill the next kid who's dumb enough to pick it up. Now all my brothers are out there, and I am peering through the window, wanting to be out there, but I wasn't allowed to be out there. It was cold, a little rainy, like we get in November, a little misty. And uh, there was a guy watching me, watching the fun, and that was my dad, and he couldn't do it anymore. So he told me to go get ready. And like a wild animal, I went and got my clothes on, and I'm just waiting for him to open the door. He opens the door, and I go shooting out into this melee of death and destruction of boys, just murder the kid with the football. And before I even get into the pile, someone just crushes me. Remember, it's no rules football. And I, to my dad's panicked, fearful eyes, I am flying through the air, like a dismembered, right? And I go crashing into the wet, muddy, germy ground. And he opens the door, and he's going to save his sick boy. His words. I'm going to come and save my sick boy. Can you guess what happened before he could get one foot out the door? I got up, just like everyone else. And I didn't bother cleaning the dirt off me. That was a badge of honor. And I went in for more. My dad used to tell this story a lot. And the question was, Jack, what did you do next? He said, I closed the door, I turned around, and never watched him like that again with sheltering, afraid eyes. I've done a lot of very adventurous things in my life. I've obviously lived a lot longer than five, and I attribute that moment as one of the key moments in his life and mine. So teenage years happen, and I don't see a good future, uh, I'm 18, and I tell Dad, he says, Michael, where are you going to college? Your brothers are in college. And I say, I'm not going to college. And he had never heard me say anything like that. And he said, well, why, why don't you think you're going to college? I said, what's the point? There's no adults alive with this disease. Why would I even bother? And he was shocked. Of course, I had been thinking this for a number of years. Never told anybody, because you don't tell people stuff. And in all of his wisdom and directness and shock, he leaned over the kitchen table and he said, bull snot. But of course, he didn't use that word. And I'm like, uh-oh. He said, you're going to college and you're going to do well. I go, well, if I'm going, I guess I better do good. I just said, he, he helped me find some hope something positive to focus on when I couldn't find it myself. And of course, I did go to college, and I did really well. I finally applied myself because I had a reason to. And I get out in the working world, everything's going great, right? I start doing good in career, and I actually travel around the country in a career, going and fixing things. So I learned how to lean into challenges a little bit. Like within the challenge is some opportunity and goodness. And if you can help others in their challenges, how much better is that? So I'm doing real good. And uh, 
after really, really concentrating on my career, working real hard, avoiding cystic fibrosis at all costs, I, I kind of started paying the price. I wasn't taking care of my body, and I had to make a choice. Do I continue working hard like this, building this amazing career, traveling from city to city, and letting my body decline? Or do I really take on the most difficult and scary thing with some hope? So I moved back to St. Charles, Missouri, where I'm from. And what they wanted me to do more than anything, and more than the pills, more than the therapy, now remember I'm an adult, so my dad can't beat on me anymore, was to exercise. Because the heavy breathing of exercise would move air through your lungs and make me cough, which was the whole idea of dad doing this therapy. So I started running, but running without a real big goal seemed pretty boring to me. So with a body that was damaged, my lungs were damaged, 20% of my lungs were dead. I don't digest food without now 13,000 pills a year. And a little strange effect of cystic fibrosis is I have a, just an astronomical uh, salt content in my sweat, which means I lose electrolytes. And any athlete knows if you lose electrolytes, you cramp up. So I've got these three huge handicaps, and I decide I'm going to run a marathon. 26.2 miles without stopping as fast as you can with this Ford Pinto of a body. Yeah, anybody here own a Ford Pinto? You, you can admit it, it's okay. They just weren't very good cars, right? And this just isn't a good body for athletics. But I was really determined to take charge of my health, take charge of my life, and so I started running. And I did really good, I ran a marathon, and I did super good. Uh, and when my father uh, came with me down to Tulsa, Oklahoma, it was just a real small marathon, just a couple hundred people running it, and we did like four loops. So dad would go out on the course and watch me go by four times. And when he went out to his spot, there was a woman there, and she was clearly watching the marathon. And, you know, dad, he would talk to a wall. So he says, what are you doing out here? Well, my husband's running, and he runs for health purposes. And I can't remember what it was, but something to keep him nice and fit. And she returns the question and says, well, well, why are you here? Who are you watching? He says, I'm watching my son. It's his first marathon. And by the way, he runs for health reasons. She's like, oh, well, what does he have? And my father responds, cystic fibrosis. And the woman starts crying, really sobbing. So dad, the ever, you know, empathetic man, what, are you okay? Did I say something wrong? She said, no, I have two grandchildren with cystic fibrosis, and all I've ever heard was death. And your son's 31? and running marathons, and as a director of sales for a big hotel company, it was shocking to her. And when dad told me the story on the long, painful ride home to St. Louis, something clicked in my brain. I had been running and living for me, just me, and here it is, something bigger than me. And it opened my mind to much bigger things, way beyond myself. I had let faith really die inside me because I just didn't trust what was going on with my life, that there could be something greater and good amidst this really personal, uh, very difficult thing that didn't seem fair. But now my mind was open to something much, much larger. Maybe I shouldn't be selfish anymore. So luck has it, I moved back home, reconnect with a childhood friend. We went to grade school together at St. Elizabeth Ann Seton out in St. Charles, and we went to Dushan High School together, and he was always a good man of faith, sticking with it and being engaged. And he would tickle me with, hey, why don't you come to church? No, no, I'm not ready. And he just kept working on me, and he kept working on me. And uh, what we know from Proverbs, 
is this. A friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for adversity. And we should probably add a brother and sister are born for adversity. A brother and sister in faith. Of course, I didn't think about that at the time when my best friend was dropping, dropping hints at me. But I knew it was time to, to, to figure it out. If there's something much, much larger, what is that larger thing? So I started picking up some books. Why do Catholics do that? Because I didn't know why we sit, stand, kneel, why we do this, why we do that. And I became fascinated with the, the, the history and meaning of all these little things we do. It started making sense. And then I was reading Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, these great thinkers, and really further opening my mind. And I, I, I was ready. I was ready to go back to, to church and, and go to Mass and receive communion. But I knew I probably had to go to confession first, right? I did remember that much from my Catholic upraising. So I was ready to go. I, I drive up to our local parish, which, crazy enough, I moved back within St. Elizabeth Ann Seton Parish, my home parish, forever. And I pull up, and it's a dark October night, right? It's maybe 7 o'clock, and it is dark. And I pull up to the church doors, and I leave the car door run, you know, cars running, doors open, and I'm sneaking in there because I don't want anybody to see what I'm doing, right? And I want this to be on my time. So I walk up to the church doors, and, and of course they're locked, right? Of course. It's in the middle of the week. It's dark. Why would I have thought I could get into the lobby of church and pick up a program? So out of the dark, I hear a voice. How can I help you? And I look over and I see a statue of Mary, and I was like, this is confusing. She shouldn't have that voice. It was the local priest, Father Hopping. He was waiting outside for his dinner ride and saw this car, he's watching the whole thing. I pull up, I go up, he comes over, how can I help you? Oh, nothing, I'll come back. No, no, really. Like he, just like my buddy Mike, he was not letting this go in the most gentle, loving, welcoming way. He said, no, let me get, let me get you a program. We'll walk, you know, we'll go in, I'll get it for you. And I'm, you know, I'm sweating like, man, this is, this is on my time, not yours. We go up, he grabs the Sunday uh, flyer, but he doesn't hand it to me. I just want him to hand it to me so I can get out of there. And he says, what are you looking for? I was like, oh, I'm just looking for confession times. It's like, oh, okay. What about now? It'd been a long, long time for all that, and I wasn't prepared. I was, I think, spiritually prepared, but I hadn't done the good practice of really getting in there. And I said, I don't even know what to say. I just don't know what to say. It's like, just say it. And I let it out, and he gives me a, just such an appropriate uh, penance. And uh, I was back in. And it really was another one of those moments where somebody, a brother, opened his heart, right? He had this open heart and welcoming. And then later, as I, I just got involved and was being regular and really excited, uh, the same friend, this grade school friend, asked me to go to a retreat. And I went to the retreat and met more brothers who would help me stay hopeful. Meanwhile, the, the disease is, is still doing what it does in the background, right? It, it doesn't go away. It's incurable. I'm still taking lots and lots of medicine, but my lung functions are declining because it's a progressive disease. And I'm still running. I'm still running, but it's getting harder and harder. I ended up running nine full marathons. In the same 11 years, 20 half marathons. And then when all that got just a little too easy, I tried an Ironman triathlon, which is 70.3 miles of continuous swimming, biking, and running. Of course, I didn't complete that race. It was really hard. And it was frustrating that I had spent a year preparing for this one race, and I failed. But all those years of overcoming and, and getting more levels of hope, just it wasn't so devastating like it might have been in the past.
as those years from running, those, so that was all in my 30s, when I turned 40, just I got some injuries, so I wasn't running as much, and my, lung, my lungs started to decline. I was in the hospital every year for eight years, my lung function's declining. Uh, at 47 years old, I was in the hospital twice that year, and my lung capacity was as low as 60%, which means 40% of my lungs are, are gone, damaged, permanently damaged from the disease. I certainly couldn't run, but what I could do was bicycle. It was a lot easier, so I got on the bike, and it was hard, hard miles. Every pedal stroke was short of breath. I couldn't go very long. I certainly couldn't go fast. But I had the hope that what I was doing would produce some sort of good outcome in the future. But I was at the point where I was like, man, I just want to get to 50. I was 47, just wanting to get to 50. Meantime, strong faith, keeping at it, seeing, still seeing things beyond myself and, and giving back to the community, receiving that back, right? That's what happens. When you give hope, it is reflected back on you in very, very ways that you might not ever imagine. So this drug comes out when I was 47, and, and we're seeing almost miraculous results within the community. And I take it. It's not doing much, a little bit, but my body can't handle it. So I have to go off that miracle medicine. And it was a frustrating. Because you're hearing the stories about how this person's doing better and that person's doing better, and now you can't take it. And then the second generation of that drug came out. They improved it a little bit. And that was the year I was in the hospital so, so much. And it stopped the progression of the disease, but I didn't feel any better because I still got this junk in my lungs, and I'm tired, and I can't really exercise like I want, but I keep going with now encouragement of my wife of 20 years. She's in that fight with me, all my friends, bolstered by faith. So in 2020, January 2020, the third generation of the drug comes along, and it went to the most sick patients first. So I'm now getting direct reports from friends within the CF community. I can't believe what's going on with my body. I'm not coughing anymore. Now this disease, makes us cough constantly. It's like when you have the flu, and when you're coughing like that, that's our existence. And I, I, I can't process what I'm hearing. Mike, I don't cough anymore. So my experience with this new drug had to wait a few months because I was still healthier than many others. But I'm nervous. Is it going to work for me? We've already been through two of these, and it's not working. So on January 5th of 2020, I start taking the medicine. And within four days, this lifelong cough disappeared. I cough no more since that date. This miracle medicine actually is something they call a functional cure. As long as I take the medicine, and as long as it keep, my body keeps responding, I will very likely not die of cystic fibrosis. It's not a cure. If I stop taking the medicine, all this stuff is going to come back. But in those four days, my lungs repaired themselves with a 20-year reversal. So in 2001, when I moved back to St. Louis to get control of the disease, stopped the rapid decline, my lung function was at 80% when I started running marathons. It had declined over the years to 60% and in four days returned to 80%. Uh, now, I've had trouble my whole life gaining weight. I've always been a little guy. My brother's a little beefier, right? I gained 20 pounds like crazy, and now I've got to diet. 
It's crazy. I got a real person problem. My doctor, who I love dearly, we have this amazing relationship, and he's from India, and I tease him about his accent, although I love it. So I, I just say, I say, Ravi, I can't believe this. And he comes into the room, he pats my belly, and he says, Michael, you have to lose some weight. And I just wanted to wring his neck. But I was so happy that I could, I can't eat what I want anymore. So each year I've been on this medicine, I've increased my bicycle mileage. I'm back to form. Last year, I rode my bicycle 6,413 miles. And I'm so upset I didn't get 6,500. No, I'm so unbelievably pleased that I can ride fast again, and I can ride a long, long time. And one day, my wife drove me up to Jefferson City, and I rode my bicycle back to St. Charles on the Katy Trail, 105 miles in one day at a very respectable pace. And I didn't cough one time. Hebrews tells us, let us hold unswervingly. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. We need to have an unwavering hope, especially amidst unpredictable, unknown outcomes. That's really when we need it most. This is what God is telling us in the prophets. This is the, the whole thing is about hope. Right? It all came together a few years ago when I wrote the book. I'm looking for things that apply to me as a runner, me as a, a guy with this disease, and, and this hope that I really wasn't even in touch with. At the, I just knew I had something. So I picked up uh, James, and this really spoke to me, and you're going to catch the word as to why it spoke to me, and I hope it speaks to you, a little, probably in a different way than it does me, but I, I want it to land for you. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let that endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If we're going to endure over a lifetime with hope, right, our hope needs to endure, not just for a day or a season or a little challenge that moves by us, but a lifetime, we need something that bolsters endurance of hope, and that's love. Uh, I went to confession one time, and it was Monsignor Riley, who was retired, but out at St. Elizabeth, and I, you know, I, I lay it out there for him, and uh, he gives me a, a penance of reading a book. So, of course, I go get the book, and it was written by a German priest, and I'm like, ugh, I know some Germans. That's going to be dry, and I'm going to suffer through this book. It was pretty dry, but two sentences lit me up. And it's a little hard to follow, but, uh, so I'll say it twice. It was this definition of love that came, you know, inspired by Paul. It's revealing to someone else that person's own beauty. Revealing to someone else that person's own beauty. We good on that definition? It's me revealing your beauty to you. And the second part of the sentence will tie it in. He says, standing in front, this is important for us to do for others, because standing in front of a mirror, we can't see it. We really so criticize ourselves so much, we lose hope, and we criticize what we've done, who we are, our failings and shortcomings. So it is incumbent upon us to encourage others through love. That's love. That's the highest form of love I can imagine. 
next to his love, right? Uh, and I received boundless amounts of that love from my parents, through my friends, through my running friends, through my lifelong, you know, St. Elizabeth and Duchenne friends, that I am pretty sure that's why my hope has remained and endured. So remember, we have to have enduring hope, and we need to help others keep that. Thank you, Lou, for having me out. Thank you to the, all of you for bringing me your attention. It is so heartwarming to see eyes on. It gives great energy and encouragement and hope. And we have a few more weeks. Um, and Mike has been a good friend of, of St. Joseph Radio, and we're so blessed to be associated with him. He inspires us, and that's what this evening did for us. So um, I hope you enjoyed the evening. I'm not sure who's coming next week, but I'm sure it's going to be special. And please remember, tomorrow's the Feast of St. Joseph. Please remember us in prayer, St. Joseph Radio. And um, thank you so much for being with us. God bless you.